Okay, <clears throat> hello everyone. Unfortunately, my, my voice is very low today. So this means you need to be very, very silent in order to hear what I say. I hope this microphone will help afterwards that you will at least watch the recording with a uh, decent voice level. I'm sorry for that. Uh, my presentation today is about application of OptaniLab software for uh, matching circuit synthesis for a number of uh, real hardware prototypes. Um, so I have here a ultra compact VNA from Copper Mountain Technologies that I'm going to be using in, in this presentation. Essentially I have a, a number of, of antenna prototypes. I'm, I'm perform performing the, the, the live measurement of these and plug OptaniLab software to the measurement data. And there are a, a number of, of interesting possibilities that this workflow enables. Of course, for all, <coughs> all these antennas, I have an Axiom model and we can directly compare the Axiom simulations and the measured prototypes. I have also built the matching networks uh, according to the suggestions from OptaniLab and we can also compare the OptaniLab uh, results with the, the real antennas. So this is, will be just a quick snapshot of, of, a, of a couple of samples. Understandably, we don't have an anechoic chamber here, neither do I have such in, in, in our office. So it might be that some of the results that we see here will be a bit different than they, they are uh, in, in when I measured them in, in the office. Um, and that, that's one, one source of error, but let's just keep in, in mind that Axiom typically assumes an open free space uh, environment. So what, what is OptaniLab? Just to <coughs> uh, in a couple of words, it's a software tool that is intended for the synthesis and optimization of matching networks, in general for RF applications. The, the most uh, kind of a famous application and, and the, the starting point of, of OptaniLab is antenna matching especially for broadband and multiband systems. Narrowband matching is, is relatively simple. So you can take, for example, with two discrete components or with two transmission line segments. As we saw earlier today, you can always find, more or less with trial and error, if nothing else, a solution for one single frequency. But if you have several bands, or if the bands are wide, the challenge gets very, very complicated. Uh, OptaniLab can synthesize the, the matching circuits up to an arbitrary order and it can directly use the vendor library models for synthesis. OptaniLab also supports simultaneous matching of several coupling antennas. So a, an antenna system, especially in hand handheld devices, it may contain several antennas that talk to each other. An antenna coupling is a loss mechanism that you have to take into account. Fundamentally, you want to maximize the radiated energy of each of the antennas. And OptaniLab also allows controlling the antenna isolation. So you can intentionally mismatch antennas to favor uh, better isolation. Sometimes isolation is, is crucial. Sometimes the e efficiency is more crucial. And OptaniLab allows control of, of multi-antenna matching. You can use, in addition to ideal models, half ideal models with, with some, say, generic losses like Q-factors for, for inductors, and the vendor library models for inductors and capacitors. You can also use transmission line networks, uh, provided that you, at the, at the moment, you still have to enter the transmission line topology manually, but you can optimize it. We plan to release, uh, probably next major release, where there is also transmission line synthesis. 
and also tunable matching networks are supported by OptiniLab. So sometimes the, the antenna matching network is active. It may uh, change the operation bands or it may change the, or react to the varying impedance environments. For example, for tablet computers, there, there are a couple of typical situations. You might have it on the lab, you might have the, 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 the lid closed or open, and there are a, a handful of, of typical positions. And each of them, they provide different impedance environment for the antenna. And with OptiniLab, it is possible to, to optimize a matching circuit with a tunable component for such a situation. And at this point, actually, <coughs> I'd like to go with uh, having just a limited amount of time to look at some of the, the prototypes. And uh, the, the first one, uh, sorry, one, one moment before going that. So the, the VNA link in, in this presentation is very essential. Uh, either you can provide the impedance data from a simulation, for example, from, from Axiom or Analyst, or from uh, measurement hardware using S parameter files. But there are direct links to Rodenswartz, Andri Tsukisai, and in this presentation, Copper Mountain Vector Network Analyzer. I chose Copper Mountain because I happen to have that. That's one of the key reasons, and this is very, very portable. And so there are some, some other, say, small scale uh, single port devices, but the, the number of ports is not a restriction. So we can take Rodenswartz, four or eight port uh, VNA, and, and plug OptinLab into that as well. But for, for demonstration and traveling, it's quite obvious that having a weight of 200 or 150 grams is different uh, challenge, as Simon may confirm. Um, so the, with the link, what we can do in practice, we can do real-time synthesis and testing of virtual matching networks without ever building them. We'll see it in a, in a moment. So we can fix, find, uh, say, free space condition and uh, fix the network, and then put the phantom head, phantom hand, different position and see how it performs. Uh, we can leave one of the, the components, change its values, uh, assume it's behind a switch, and, and it acts as a, as a tuner component and seeking a tuner range, for example, for adaptive tuner implementation. And in general, we can also take the antenna prototype in the lab and tune the mechanics of the antenna to seek the most advantageous matching circuit. Like discrete components, they have so coarse uh, stepping. If you take a certain library, you don't have all the values there. So it might be instead you might tune the antenna prototype itself. So the, the first prototype, <coughs> it's a PIFA type antenna here. It's designed to provide uh, inherently matching at about 1.9 gigahertz. Uh, here in this picture, we have also the Axiom simulation of the, of the data. So th the manufacturing data for these prototypes actually come from AWR. So it's very easy for me then to create the Axiom model. And, and especially if we look at the Smith chart, we understand that actually the uh, Axiom uh, agreement with the measurement is, is, is pretty nice. And um, remember that we are simulating open space and we are measuring at NI office. But let's see how it would look like. Um, <coughs> in order to provide some amount of standardization, I have a text fixture here, as I said, I can at least repeat more or less the the measurements, if I now just remember how, how to do that. And so we can see that it's, you can kind of by <laughs> bare hands, you can actually sense almost the, the radiation pattern <laughs> like this. So don't, don't make it too complicated. And so if we look at the um, Smith chart, so we can see, observe that it's, it corresponds quite nicely the, the blue measurement, so which is just saying that the impedance environment 
of this office and my office back home is about the same. And with this measured data, we can now, if we go to the Opteni lab, if I now, now open the, the software, and here I choose connect to network analyzer, I can choose to measure continuously from the network analyzer. And now if I set the axis, I freeze the axis scaling to something like this. So now, now I'm essentially taking the measurement data into, uh, into OptaniLab. And, and this is now the basis for, for my matching network design. And if I put it on hold for a moment, and I can now, now choose to the, the frequency range or the band of interest. And I go uh, analyze matching circuit generation, and I choose the band. And if I take, for example, the LTE band 4 uh, in this case, and in order to have the uh, similar uh, or such a design which corresponds to the instruments and, and, and components that I have, I pick here a particular library, which is in this case Oilcraft 0603 CS, for which I have the, the designer's kit. And for the capacitors, I have a similar for Murata uh, GQM18 0603 components. The topology order can be chosen here. So I can choose one, two, three, for how many components is necessary. Uh, in this case, probably um, we'd be good with, for example, let's go with two components. Because this is already resonating quite, quite okay at, um, at, at this uh, LTE band, band 7. So here we have the, the measured response with this matching circuit for, for this uh, antenna prototype. And OptaniLab exposes a couple of different topologies. So it, it's, it's providing the, the top performing first, and the performance is evaluated against the efficiency target. There are lossy components, and you can end up with a resistive matching network, especially with high Q antennas. So efficiency is the thing that we are watching. In special cases, it might be the reflection also. But with 50 ohm load, we can always get a very nice uh, matching. So don't be fooled by seeing a suspiciously good uh, S11. With just a 50 ohm uh, calibration reference, you can get very good matching, right? And. Um, so here I can now fix, uh, I modify this such that I, I fix the values. So um, essentially now I have decided that my uh, free space optimized matching circuit is the one that I want to test. And now it's straightforward for me to take the phantom head and place the antenna next to it. And so we can, we can monitor on real time, how, how this matching network would work with, with this phantom. Or if there is a kind of hand position, if the hand is close to the antenna, it's not necessarily so good, but if we put it, if it's a handset and if it's down there, it's further away from the, from the uh, antenna, then the damage to the efficiency is much lower. And see how quick it, it happened. And then, then we can move on and, and, and try some other, say, topology. Some other library series, um, three components instead of two, that stuff. And indeed, if we here, coming back to the presentation, um, how to uh, then, okay, this was kind of, we were assuming kind of zero-sized components. When we do it really carefully, depending a little bit upon the, the frequency range, if we have to care about it or not, uh, in OptaniLab, when you have decided the topology, then you can add microstrip lines to model the finite distance, two millimeters, for example, between the components. 
but we can actually, because I have the axiom model already of this whole layout, including the, the region in which there are the, the, the matching components. And I can take that layout model directly. So it's very, very easy. And then I can use uh, Optenilab on that model. If I just need to interpret it, it, it properly. And uh, what, what Optenilab says here is that the first series component, the, the port numbers refer now to this picture. So I create a layout model in Axiom and import it into uh, Optenilab. And then I terminate that five port, in this case, essentially the port one, I will terminate with the measured antenna. And then I, I have all the, the layout parasitics in, taken into account here. So the first series component closest to the antenna radiator shall be 5.1 picofarad uh, Murata. There shall be 3.3 uh, nanohenry uh, coil craft in shunt and another 1.3 picofarad. I have now, now used three, three component uh, matching. I can do tolerance analysis on the vendor components and, and in order to identify potentially unstable designs. So it's not, not necessarily so clear in advance uh, whether it's going to be stable or not. And then it's microscope and soldering. And in this case, it happens, in fact, that the, that, that, um, <coughs> this is now the uh, prototype with these, the shown values. And, um, Um, have you seen this, this shape in the Opteni logo ever? <clears throat> anyway, it, it indicates a, a neat matching. If we look at the... So it's a double, double resonant. Um, so this is... I just did what Opten said me to do, and I used this this uh, axiom layout model and uh, the first first measurement. And because they, they are practically speaking, they are identical. So there is, I can use this this prototype for measuring the raw antenna, and then I'm taking the I have calibrated this. Um, yeah, the, the calibration. There is a phase difference because I have different standards for the for the probe calibration and then uh, for the SMA. So here, to be precise, it does not change the, say, uh, return loss curve, but I actually need to take this, uh, if we want to have a, a comparable uh, result in the Smith chart. And here, scale. All right, so double resonant circuit. It looks slightly different than in the office. And so probably it's a little bit sensitive to the environment or how, how close I'm sitting to the antenna. Nonetheless, a, a pretty neat performance. It's actually, in this case, it's better than, than the simulation. And uh, it may be just a magical <laughs> capability in building matching circuits, or it may indicate also some additional loss uh, in the real hardware. And so there are other further indications that indeed there, there might be more loss uh, in the substrate than reported by, by the vendor. And so the next prototype actually will touch upon that. So sometimes it may happen that your, simula your measurement is, is better than your simulation. Usually it's other way around. The, the second prototype is a short monopole antenna. And it's special in, in that uh, there is a, an aperture capacitor that is supposed to tune it to 433 megahertz. So it's, it's, it's quite small in compared to the wavelength. 
and that's why the capacitor is, is needed to bring the resonance down. And the first step, it's, it's documented in one of our tutorials, is to find out, use a two-port model of this one and find out the value, how big capacitor we need. And it turns out to be about one picofarad. So I have put one picofarad here, and so we can go back to the measurement again. And then let me just take again the calibration for the probe and set the frequency, say, from 300 to 700 megahertz. Right, and 400, so one, one megahertz steps. It looks about like this. <coughs> Let me add a marker. Um, 400. Sorry. So we are there, <coughs> and then we have a simulation model of the same. And I can maybe show it here in the axiom. And this is the measurement, and this is okay. Now I have parameterized in the axiom model the loss tangent of the substrate. And because I was just interested in, in seeing that it's poss possibly something that we, we need to, to worry about. The, the, the vendor value or the datasheet value for this uh, loss tangent was 0 0.00. .00 Three. So this is a Rogers substrate. And if we bring it down that, that far away, then we can see that the, the, the simulation curve here, the blue, uh, is clearly too optimistic. Uh, it's not this metallic structure that is causing the, lo the loss. It's something else. And so if we just make brutally the assumption that, that the loss tangent is 0.05, then at least we get an excellent agreement between the, the measurement and the simulation, as we can see. And so, in fact, what I did since this point, I, I was using for the, for the rest uh, an assumption of, of this high, high loss tangent. It might be a combination of, of metal losses or some unknown losses, but nonetheless, this way we can get an agreement with, uh, with the measurement. And, um, So, <coughs> basically the same way, uh, using the simulation data, the manufacturing data, it's easy for me to, to place ports. Optane Lab says that with two components you can do a decent matching for 433. And so I shorted a couple of ports and I left one of the shunt ports open, as shown. This is the Optane Lab synthesis. Uh, so it, it said that you'd better have 1.1 picofarad trimmer capacitor in the, this port 4 is the uh, port over there. And then 10 picofarad series and 18 picofarad shunt component. So I did like this. Uh, <coughs> and what we find out. Again, the calibration. Mm. 
not so bad. Uh, the marker is, okay, today it's, the marker here in the Smith chart is 433. Uh, yesterday it was 431, so it was 2 megahertz off. Uh, with, with the analysis in either in Optenilla or Microwave Office, you can very easily uh, find out that this uh, frequency is very, very sensitive to the uh, to the capacitor, which is encircled there, which is essentially making this this monopole longer. And when when you quantify it with a simulator, you see that one point five, point one picofarad step reduces the the frequency resonance by ten megahertz. And this point one picofarad is the stepping in the in the series in in this Murata series. And it seems like there's been a 20 uh, femtofarad additional capacitance in this room or something like that, because now it's, it's on the spot. <coughs> and so we can see that when I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, my finger close to the capacitor and adding a little bit capacitance, so you can see that it starts moving pretty rapidly. So I'm not commenting whether or not this is a practical implementation, if, if from day to day it may change. Maybe you need to cover it properly or, or find some other solution. But it shouldn't still conflict the conclusion that this uh, result that I, I have after soldering my, my components in place, they, it, it agrees very well with what I see in, in the Optani lab. And so it, this is how it was yesterday. So the frequency was off a little bit, but we saw how, how sensitive it is. Okay, the last prototype <coughs> it's, uh, looks like this, so-called waveguide-backed sl uh, slot antenna. So there is a slot in, the, in here, and, and then there is a, essentially a waveguide which is formed by a kind of such an aluminium profile and the ground plane homemade <coughs> and uh, here we can see the inherent kind of unmatched performance both axiom and measurement again very good uh, agreement now and now I'm using this higher loss tangent actually for this substrate it's I, I, this is something I need to explore more but this is any anyway a lesson so um, that we have to be careful and not necessarily uh, take the, the uh, data as, as is from the data sheet always. Actually, was it the last time Technical University of Vienna had a very nice presentation of, of uh, material characterization using different structures, maybe two years ago. Anyway, so I, I used the previous prototype where it just quickly say at least find a f solution that seems to work. And the, the axiom agreement with, with this prototype is also excellent. So this could be, for example, Wi-Fi. Its inherent resonance is close to 2.5 gigahertz. I decided, however, uh, to, well, one curiosity before. Uh, we, we did the first measurements and we observed an additional resonance that was not there in the simulation. And then by inspecting carefully the, the way how it, it's soldered to the ground plane and this, this metal uh, profile, we found out that there was actually one missing. So it was not properly soldered. And then I, I just tried with Axiom, can I see that resonance? And the answer is yes. And here, here it is. So between, in, in the, well, there is this uh, red uh, square, there was the, the solder kind of via missing. And it enables the, the feed line coupling directly between this now wider opening, kind of, uh, in, in this uh, structure. And that was causing a 2.7 gigahertz resonance. So otherwise the resonances are set by the, by the distance between those soldering points. So it's beyond 5 gigahertz normally. But because of my mistake, it's, it's funny that you were able then to kind of recover the, the phenomenon in the simulation also. <coughs> and and it, it was very clear when, when you touched the out, so outer surface of the, the waveguide, you saw lots of things happening. In, in, in reality, 
in the real operation mode, there are no currents outside, they are inside. So, um, the, so the, the matching target for this antenna was then uh, to make it wideband. So Wi-Fi would be easy, it's already matched to Wi-Fi. I just wanted to try what I, I will find out if I'm doing a wideband matching 2.1 to 3 uh, gigahertz. And same procedure. And so let's look how, how it looks. Does it look the same today than yesterday? And here I change again. Now I have the, the SMA. And, but let's evaluate it between 1.5 and 3.5 gigahertz. My um, calibration standards probably are not really good even at 3 gigahertz. So this is, this is one, one source of error. Um, maybe quickly showing however that... Okay, so it's, it's as, as good as, as my um, resistors are 50 ohm. So there are 200 ohm resistors in, in, in parallel. And so this, this makes at least consistent, so the, the cable is not, not causing much issues at, at these frequencies. It would be fantastic actually to characterize this one with Ronen Swartz device, and I would have my own calibration standard then. But assuming, uh, say, relatively frequency independent resistors, this should be good enough. And it's agreeing quite well with the simulations. And so we see the Opteni logo again appearing there. And uh, it's radiating this way, so I take the radiation to myself rather. <coughs> it's not the high level, it's I think minus 10 dBm, don't worry. And um, yeah, there's may maybe some say averaging things that you can do to smooth the, the curve. And so this is now with the matching circuit. So because these are then individuals, there is so much handwork to connect this. So each and every sample will look different. That's why I don't have this unmatched anymore. This was the un unmatched, but then I, I put the matching circuit in there. And so we just look the uh, return loss. And so if we take the scale at uh, say, Five. So we can see that putting the markers at the target was 2.1 and 3 gigahertz. And behold, so we get a <coughs> well better than minus 6 dB uh, return loss depending upon the day and the, in the office and the environment, it may be about minus seven dB. But we see that this is pretty neatly actually balanced also along over the, the, uh, the band. And I'm not cheating here. This was the, the first shot. I, I did them yesterday and I, don't, I didn't have any time even then to think twice. I just had to go. And um, so if we, we look the, here, the, the picture is a little bit small, but especially we, when we compare the, the matched and axiom simulated prototype, uh, sorry, the, it's a measured prototype with the, uh, the matching circuit in the Smith chart, then the loop is slightly tilted. I think, I suspect it's due to my de-embedding using a lossy transmission line. So a little bit, some, something to be considered later. So the loop shape is very, very close to the actually measured, even though in the, in the uh, when we look the, the return loss in XY plot, then it looks a little bit different. But anyway, the, the matching level that we really find out with the prototype agrees very well with the, with the, the simulation. So this more or less concludes this brief uh, 
introduction to Optinilab usage and, and having a little bit look of the, the real prototypes comparing with the Axiom simulations, they have turned out to be very accurate once you pay attention to the that your, your modeling fundamentals are correct, especially regarding the, the, the material parameters. So that was it. You have some material on if you are interested in, in Optinilab and uh, my contact info. My voice is down, as I said, I'd, I'd be glad to discuss more, but I'm trying to save my, my voice for, for another time. Thank you. Thank you.